Welcome back to the channel folks and to another painting tutorial and it's the first on our Flames of War content folks we've got some planes. Here we have a flight of ME262s. The scale for these by the way folks is 144th that's 1 to 144th so that means they are a smaller scale than the standard Flames of War figures which are 1 100th but that just makes them more practical to use on the tabletop because a 1 100th scale plane is going to be quite big and take up a lot of space so it's, it's a good compromise. Whilst painting planes is going to have many similarities to painting the tanks and other vehicles it is going to require a bit of a different approach so this is a, a, a bit of a new challenge for me I will be reflecting on that as I go and making changes to what I'm doing as required. So I'll explain them as I come to them. So it looks like these planes are starting to get out of formation on the turntable here folks. So I think we better just get started. So let's get painting. I'm going to begin by having a look at the kits, checking the wings. These resin pieces with such thin long parts as the wings can have bends in them. So I'm going to have to check both the kits to see if anything needs addressing. You can see there that one has got a definite issue on its right wing. Now just remember to check the rest of the plane too. It's the thinner areas I'm more concerned with, such as the tail. It may also, in this case, be a little bit twisted. And that's where we're going to have to use a cup of boiled water to dip the affected part in. And when I did it with these individuals, the, the, the wing instantly just popped into shape and stayed in shape afterwards. So take a bit of time at this point to check it out. There's not usually a lot of flash on the resin kits because they're made in like solid mould so to speak. It's not a mould that comes together in two parts but there quite often is little bits of resin here and there that you're going to have to attend to. So a little file and a bit of care and you'll get that dealt with no bother at all. Now remember when you're filing something like a, a wing which is thin and can become a big lever if you put too much pressure on it, make sure you're holding the wing, supporting the wing so you're not going to snap it if you're a bit rough. There are some metal components that come with this. You know, there's the, the, the nose, there's a couple of bombs to go on the underside. So just prepare them as you would any other metal kit. You know, you're going to have to file down the mould edges on these pretty much every time, even if it's a nice good casting, it'll probably still leave a mark. And then there's also the area where you've clipped it off the sprue. You're going to have to file that down. And notice by the way I'm doing this and working generally over an old tin of a box of chocolates. So that catches all this lots and lots of dust and, and everything that is falling off the figure as we're working on it. Keeps everything neat and tidy and prevents this from spreading all over your workspace which is bad for you and bad for the finished result. Attaching the nose cone and the engine cowlings will require a little bit of work. These resin kits, when they're mated up with the metal components, they're not always going to give you an absolutely perfect fit as plastic kits would do. So you'll have to either pair away at the resin, do that carefully because it can break, it's brittle, or you can pair away at the metal. Just have a look at where you think the issue lies by doing some dry fitting and that will guide you on how you're going forward. Just remember if you are working on the resin parts, take your time. A file is good but not always useful because of the, the shape of the issue if you understand where you need to be removing the resin. So go carefully, check as you're working to see if you've got the, the result you need. And when you are doing your fitting folks, remember to look at the components from all around, you know, up down and from the sides because you might have something that looks like a good fit in one angle but in the other angle is maybe a, a big gap that will need some attention. So that's us ready to do some assembly. We've got some nice straight wings now 
you know, so we're ready to just finish off the kit. The boiling water worked a treat, like I said it would here folks. That was the plane that was with a really wonky wing before. And I'm going to use gel super glue. I find it is a good filler, you know, if, um, if you've got something that's got a bit of a gap in it, like the front of the plane and the, the internal area of the, the nose cone, it helps fill that gap and, you know, they're therefore giving it a stronger attachment, a bit like resin, not as strong as resin, but you don't need to use something such as Arrowdite here when you're putting on such small components. The bombs don't have a set mount to be attached to, so I'm just gluing them on to the surface of the plane. Now, you can use accelerator for this. I've found I've used it in the past and it gets these kind of jobs done very quick because it's quite annoying trying to hold a tiny little piece in place whilst it dries. Seems to take forever. Accelerator will make it go a lot quicker, almost instant, but it will give you a slightly more brittle finish to the super glue, but nothing that you need to be concerned with. So here is our ME262s prepped, assembled, cleaned and ready for some paint. Incidentally I'm also working on some Typhoons and they're using the newer form of plastic that Battlefront are using mostly on their infantry figures, so stay tuned for the tutorial on that one that's coming up because I will refer to the difference between the two materials in that guide. Okay folks, let's get painting. Now I've started by giving the plane an undercoat of white paint with some gloss varnish added just to help protect it during the masking process that uh, that's going to follow. Now the white is a good base in this respect because we're also going to be leaving a lot of the plain white as you will see to match the camo pattern that we've chosen. The two colours I'm going to use for the greens on the plain are military green and medium olive. Now I started airbrushing using the medium olive as the first coat and then I realised with it being such a light colour it was going to take me forever to get the first eh, couple of coats down because remember when you're airbrushing you're putting down semi-opaque layers of paint building them up but I thought it's going to take far too long to get everything down here with the medium olive as the first coat because of all that white. So I changed to the military green and it went a lot quicker. At this stage I've got to give some care to the underside. I'm, I'm going to have to come back and respray the white anyway on the sides, on the flanks and on the, the tail fin, but I don't want to get the green paint on the underside as much as possible. So we can now give some thought to how we're going to make this camouflage. So we've got some wavy lines, some soft lines and also some straight sharp lines. So I'm going to have to do some freehand spraying and also some masking. So I'm going to compare the plane to this example and use that as a guide. And I'm going to start by doing some masking and I'm going to be using the, um, the, the sticky part of a post-it note. Now the glue in the post-it note is enough to attach it to the figure but it's quite soft, it's got a low tack. You have to be careful that the edges are sticking down as you're working, especially on curved surfaces. It can be a bit more tricky but it's a very forgiving way of masking compared to using masking tape. I've speeded up this section a little bit folks so you can see the whole process and then I can just chat over important points. So let's get started by me working on a bit of a, a masking panel. I'm being guided by the example in the box. When I say guided, I mean I'm not trying to make it an exact replica. So I've cut out a piece of post-it. Remember this is just the sticky part on the top of the post-it folks. So it sticks obviously. And I'm also using a bit of blue tack here because the the green, the area that needs to be masked, goes down the 
the sides of the, the engines there, the engine pods, so that you're not going to achieve that with a little bit of post it because it's a very curved shape which should take you forever to cut out but you can get the result you need with a little blob of blue tack which you then work to the shape that you're after. It's quite a straightforward process folks, there's not a lot of masking needed. I do recommend that you just leave the masking on each plane, don't mask one, airbrush it and then use the same masking on the other one. That will just add to your time, just do both planes at the same time and keep them looking roughly the same, they don't have to be exact. Take care to ensure the edges of your masking are down nice and tight. That way you're going to get a nice sharp finish. You're not going to get a bit of a, a soft edge, a bit of a shadow. That's not what we're after. And of course, folks, you can always just do this by brush. Airbrushing always gives you a smoother, flatter finish. You know, where the, the, the tone of the paint is going to be consistent across every panel, every little area, because you're, you're painting lots of different panels here. So airbrushing, is going to get you, in my opinion, a better result. But if you don't have an airbrush, you can still get great results using your good old hairbrush. I'm also going to put a bit of masking on the nose. It's going to get a bit tight in there when I'm airbrushing in the white part of the, the camouflage that you see on the flanks of the plane. And we are ready to airbrush. Now, this is not a part of the process that requires a great deal of care or attention. I'm, I'm just taking medium olive and I'm going to spray it over the, the surfaces, the, the upper surfaces. You know, I'm going to be careful of the underside and I'm just going to put on over several thin layers sufficient paint so I've got some nice solid medium olive as you will see when the masking comes off contrasts nicely with the military green. Now let's take some white and find any areas of overspray that, you know, of the green that's gone on to the underside of the wings or the fuselage. If we're being careful here, there shouldn't be any real problems. We've done a little bit of masking around the engine covers as well, so that's an area that would definitely have some overspray, but we should, if we're careful, have covered all of that quite nicely. So it's just going to be the odd spot, the odd area here and there. And it goes without saying that we need to be careful not to get any of this touch-up white onto the masked camo we've got on the upper fuselage of the plane. So keep the, the plane flat or spray so that the overspray goes beyond the edge of a wing and away from the fuselage. Just be careful where you're pointing the airbrush. Okay, so there's more work to do with the white here, but we're going to be working on the upper side of the fuselage, around the wings and the tail planes, where we have camo that we want to protect. You know, we want to keep that camo, we don't want any white on it. So, this is going to require a degree of freehand airbrushing and a little bit of masking, where overspray is likely to fall down onto the flat surfaces of the wings. We're not going to get this down at the necessary level of coverage in one pass. So I'm going to have to take a few passes, so we need to be patient and we need to also be consistent in where we're applying this on the fuselage. Ideally I want to get the solid band of white that's going along the bottom of the 
the fuselage and over the wings and the tail planes and the wavy edge, soft airbrushed camo wavy edge, not a sharp edge like on the wings. I want to get all that done at this point here. But I've created a bit of a problem for myself, I didn't mix the white paint correctly. So there's a tiny bit of overspray higher up onto the greens and that's not what I'm after. It's lightening things too much. I mean we're talking a small degree but it's still lightening things too much and also just pushing out that soft edge a bit further than I want it to be. So I'm going to have to come back and fix that because you can't, it's like as I say quite often it's like adding salt when you're cooking. If you add too much, you can't take it out. You've got to go back in and compensate. So I can't fix this problem with getting a better mix of white and starting from scratch. I need to go in and fix the, the green areas again, which is work we could all do without. But it'll take a little bit more time and we'll get a much better result. Right folks, we've finished the white. We've tidied up any overspray from the white and we're now ready to add all those soft little dots that you'll see on the box art. And the box art is going to guide us here folks. Look at the box art to know how many to place and where to place them so that we don't go a bit crazy and get this looking you know, a bit like a polka dot. Now we're just looking for an accent to the white here. So if you're familiar with using your airbrush this should be nice and straightforward. Just make sure you've got the mix of the paint right so it's going to go on in one easy action. Just enough air, just enough pressure on the like backward pressure on the trigger and control the movements of your airbrush in and out you know like off the figure so that you're not accidentally releasing some paint as you pull the airbrush away or releasing paint when you're too far away from the the plane you'll see I'm working really quite close to the the surface here and we can get a real good feel for how it's going to look now folks we're making some good progress and it's looking like a totally menacing predator of the skies now there needs to be a little lighter core to these camo dots on the white I'm not going to use the medium olive that I use on the fuselage because there is not enough of a difference between that and the military green once it's been sprayed on. You don't really notice it. So I've gone for a bright green. Any kind of bright green will do here, folks. Because I'm just painting a little soft core of paint, you know, quite wet, not not a, not putting a thick coat of paint on here. Quite wet blob in the middle, and that'll do us. There's some touch-ups required as well along the edges of the wings. It's difficult to be 100% precise when you're doing this airbrushing folks and you can do masking up to a point but it'd be really tricky to leave all the masking in place for all the different processes that we've, we're applying here. You know the different approaches to the camo. So there's going to be a, a few areas you're just going to have to go in with the brush and touch up. But it's a straightforward process, cause you no problem at all and be really quick. Now the bombs, not the mountings, but the bombs themselves, you know, because there's that little casting that we have glued on to the fuselage has got a mounting point and the bomb. So I'm going to paint the bomb German grey and I'm also going to paint the internal areas of the, the engines, the front and back. They're going to get the same treatment. Then you can layer it up just to give it a bit of depth with a layer of dark grey and a highlight of London Grey. There's not a lot of detailing required on this plane. It doesn't have rockets and racks or uh, external cannons or such like. So it's just a couple of points like this that we need to give some attention to. Right folks, it's time for a wash. I've given the whole plane a coat of gloss varnish. Not a heavy, heavy coat folks, just enough to make the surface slick so that 
the wash that we're going to use will have a good capillary action. There'll be a low surface tension. The paint will flow along panels and you can see me doing that here. Now there are a few products that you can use to do this that are ideally suited. I mean you can just try and do this with any old acrylic and you will do okay but you'll probably find you need to do a lot of tidying up for a sharp finish and you don't want to do that if you're looking for the smoothed airbrush look. So what I've used here is an acrylic wash from MIG Ammo. You can use enamel washes and get similar results. I prefer the acrylic A because of drying time, B because of fumes and to be honest from my own personal experience I actually find it works better than the enamels. Now hopefully you can see the level of control that I've got here in applying this wash and how easy it is to work with. There you see somebody just brushing some excess off. That's because of the A the qualities of the wash whether acrylic or enamel and the gloss surface, the low surface tension. You can almost at certain points just touch the wash to a panel and it will draw itself along those lines, capillary action as they call it. And here with this wash in particular I find with this wash you can also paint it directly into the all the various panel lines and such likes. And this is something I also do with tanks. If you've seen the tanks videos this is something very very familiar to you. But you can see how straightforward it is here and how little cleanup is required. And I do my cleanup immediately. I don't allow the wash to dry a little bit. This wash will be workable for several hours and the thicker you put it on the more time it will be workable for. But I like to remove any excess that's sitting on flat areas of panels immediately and that way you're going to get a brighter, cleaner finish. I'm using the dark brown MIG acrylic wash here for the underside and for the upper surface too. Now you might want to consider using a different colour between the two but as the panel lines move around the aircraft they're not just on the underside of the wings they're on the side of the fuselage and go 360 degrees around it then I'm happy to use this one colour that looks okay for both the dark and for the lighter surfaces. But if you've got a surface which is on the bottom pure white with no lines going into the darker areas you might perhaps choose a light blue colour. That will give you a softer finish but still be sufficient to, uh, to show all those panel lines so you get a good feel for the, the shape and any depth in the mini. So be patient when you're doing this folks and you will get great results. As you can see it's got really sharp lines for no great effort, you know just a little bit of patience and control. I've not recorded the uh, the lines on the, the upper side on the dark green but I just follow the same process as you see here. Now that's the bulk of the work done on these, we really just have to do a few finishing touches. One thing I'm not going to do and you would see me doing on armour kits for instance is edge highlighting the panels. There are so many panels on these planes that it would just look like a maze, a total maze. You just want to have a nice good sharp wash, you know a pin wash to show the, or the various panels up. Don't try to edge highlight them. You can put some wear and tear on the planes, that does look good, but if you are going to do it keep it within reason, you know. Um, keep anywhere around where the pilot would mount the plane on the wings for instance and use nice bright metallic colours to show any exposed steel but that's not the look I'm after here. The kind of finishing touches I'm doing is you could see a couple of wing lights and then we're on to the canopy. Now there's lots of different ways to approach painting canopies. You know you're, you're trying to create 
the impression of shimmering glass. So what I've done here is very simple. I've just layered up some blue. Check the description for the, the paints that I've used, folks. Just layered up some blue and then dotted some highlights across the surface, like reflections. The canopy on this plane is quite small, so you don't have a large area to work on. So just try and keep things in scale and look to create something reflective. And incidentally, a little coat of gloss varnish when you're finished will help in that respect. And to finish off, just a few really bright spots using white or, as I'm doing in this case, some deck tan. So after adding the decals, I applied a coat of matte varnish over everything with some gloss on the canopy. And that's us done. There is the finished flight. I think they look really nice. Look like proper flying sharks, as I said before. As I first started painting them, you know, the green, it just didn't look right at all. I thought, oh my goodness, you know, these are like flying pigs, not flying sharks. But just got to stick with it, folks, especially if you've not painted something before and you're not confident, you, you still have to keep going and work through any issues that you come across. For me, one of the issues here was obviously the mix of paint, uh, getting the, the overspray coming from the white. White can be tricky, you know, so just build up your experience with airbrushing if you're not confident too, and don't be scared to give it a try. So hopefully you found that useful, interesting, and maybe give you some ideas of how you're going to get this camo pattern on your own uh, Sturm Vogels. And as always, folks, just like to say thank you for watching. Thanks to all the subscribers out there, and thanks to people who just drop into the channel from time to time to see what we're up to. If you'd like to subscribe, please do so. It helps us build the channel and you know, it encourages you to, to bring this kind of content to other people who enjoy painting and the game of Flames of War. So subscribe, hit the bell button, that means we'll definitely see you all on the next one.